Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Hey, hey everybody, Z Garcia here. Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. Hey everybody. Hello everybody, and welcome to a very, very, very special episode. It's all about board games, board games, and the people who love board games. <laughs> However trite the notion, it would seem that running a business is its own strategic horror game. But whereas a publisher with lesser resolve would be corrupted by cost-cutting strategies, TEDx Games has remained stalwart, opting to abstain from cutting corners. And so, every corner of this campaign and every corner of this board game box remains unblemished by the maddening blight called greed. Top to bottom, this project is lovingly crafted. While the artwork is displayed as the game's beautiful and treasured core, not unlike a pearl in a clam, it is instead how the game has been designed, marketed, and packaged that has truly lured me in. I've been seduced by artwork one too many times. I've answered the siren's call enough that I've become wise to her penchant to overpromise and underdeliver. Like the game's horrifyingly depicted Selkie, I will attempt, with my words, to wear the skin of this game to invert its original intent into a backwards designed abomination, a review in which I haven't actually played the game. It's perfectly speculative, but is that not what every crowdfunding campaign asks us to do? To stand at the edge of the internet's port, to cast our line into the briny deep, to hope. It's perfectly speculative and the reason why I'm liable to return home with chum from time to time. I like to cast my reel into murky waters. Deep Regrets Briny Deep has three depths to it. My review will anchor into the structure and will have three depths to it as well. Depth 1 will be devoted to the world that this game creates. Depth 2 will consider how this game interacts with the larger board game world. And Depth 3 will be devoted to how the game ripples out into the world at large. Within our board game and hobby, there exists this idea that the further you wade in, the heavier your preferences get. It's understandable, when a game is more complex, it's more likely to be worth its weight in gold. Heavier games cost more resources for the publisher to make, and more resources for the hobbyist to purchase and learn. Thus, the general argument is that if so many people are putting up with a game's heaviness, there has to be good reason for it. This would explain why it's heavyweight games, not lightweight games, that rise to the top of Board Game Geek's Top 100. Deep Regrets even hooks into this idea, as the fish found in the lower sections of the briny deep are harder to catch and are accordingly worth more than the smaller fare to be found in Depth 1. The big game I've been hunting for, however, my ever-elusive white whale, has not been a big game at all. I've been bereft of the perfect lightweight game for far too long. A game that's easy to teach newcomers. A game that is easy to table. See, but the problem is, it's easy to grow tired of these types of games, to regret your purchase. So what makes Deep Regrets any different? At its heart, Deep Regrets is a pusher luck style game, one which has players rolling four-sided dice that resemble buoys. These bespoke wooden dice dictate the ebb and flow of the game. Roll favorably, generally higher value dice allow you to catch higher value fish, and you'll have a better time at sea. Fish and fish adjacent creatures can be classified into two categories, fair and foul. The fish are splayed out in a 3x3 grid called the briny deep. The briny deep is divided into three depths, where most basically fish get larger and fouler with each depth that you descend down. Fair fish present less risk and because of this, often yield less rewards. The riskier fish see you accruing regrets, which send you spiraling down the game's madness track. This track is crucial as it dictates the tides of the game. How much are fair and foul fish worth? How many dice can you roll? 
the madness track serves as your compass or your rudder as you navigate these questions. Play it too safe, and you'll likely miss the vast potential of the ocean. You'll altogether roll with fewer dice and unlock fewer abilities. But the player who goes off the deep end, who has the most regrets by game's end, will have to discard one of their most valuable fish. So the question of how much madness is too much madness is difficult, and amorphous, much like turbulent water. The game takes place over six days. Excluding the first day, you'll have to decide whether to put in at the briny deep or to sell your haul at port. Going to port allows you to buy dice and equipment which will help you when you're out at sea. You can also mount fish for scoring multipliers. Suddenly your fish that's worth 8 points can triple in value. But in the case that you mounted that fish and went the most mad, this would be the fish you would have to discard. And there's the rub. The core gameplay loop is simple. Roll dice, catch fish, accrue madness, and buy equipment. Crucially, while the game introduces randomness through die rolls, you roll before you make any decisions for the day. And while most of the time you don't know what fish you'll be catching until you decide to reveal them, the backs of the fish cards have shadows that correlate to the size of the fish, small, medium, and large. As if you were staring into dark water, you'd be able to estimate the general size of the fish, while still leaving room for the surprising thrill of the catch. So this game offers players plenty of levers to pull in order to mitigate luck. Rather thematically, players can fiddle with the mechanics of the game as if they were anglers adjusting the reels on their fishing rods. As a general rule of thumb, cards are an elegant way to add depth to a game without introducing more rules, as each card will break or modify a rule instead of introducing a new one. And so the game remains simple and streamlined, but introduces variability and complexity through dice, random card reveal, and card abilities. Players can even eat fish that they catch at sea to, say, re-roll dice or descend another depth. The luck in randomness is as unknowable as weather and thus prevents min-maxers from solving the game. But luck mitigation grants players enough autonomy to weather untimely storms. Now, up until this point, I've only mentioned the competitive game, which can accommodate 2-5 to five players. There's also a solo mode that on the surface looks like a lesser game. To be sure, it is a quieter game. The madness track is done away with entirely. Instead, you'll be documenting the fish that you catch over the course of campaign. And rather than deciding between going to the briny deep or to port each day, you dock your ship once and only once at the end of the week. When you arrive, you must discard fish that total, in value, the same amount of regrets that you accumulated. While you are altogether going to port less frequently than in the competitive game, the equipment you buy carries over from game to game in the solo implementation. I'm aligned with the designer in disliking the rules overhead that comes with maintaining an artificially intelligent player. So while this game is inarguably a stripped version of the competitive game, I'd argue that it is a distillation, a doubling down of the mechanics that make the competitive game so fun. The internet is constructed in such a way that it incentivizes creators to chase after the hotness. I am, flatly, uninterested in riding the wave of what's trending and what's popular because, I believe, underneath the surface there is an undercurrent of mediocrity. Listen to this excerpt from my favorite board gaming channel, Shut Up and Sit Down. They make this comment in jest, but I believe there's some real depth to what they're saying. I don't understand. I don't understand this reference to the ephemeral construct that is modern popular culture, which is inevitably uh, arbitrary until you finally have the lens and the focus and the filter of the passage of time to properly assess and evaluate whether something really is of value or interest. So why am I reviewing a Kickstarter then? Well, because quite literally I am reviewing the Kickstarter campaign, not just the game. Welcome to Depth 2. Herein lies the can of worms that publisher Judson Cowan has opened. Kickstarter as a website in Like the Sea is a cruel mistress. There's this beautiful quote from a French writer and aviator that reads, If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Kickstarter, or at least the manner in which many publishers have used Kickstarter, has taught us to yearn for the infinite. 
Like the sea, a Kickstarter campaign is open-ended and brimming with potential. It's this dream that convinces us to jump on board. This approach that most publishers take in order to ship. The worm at the end of the line, the song at the edge of the sea, and the stretch goal at the bottom of the campaign present like an incentive. But really, these things are all an illusion, a false promise of autonomy. Like I said at the top of this review, running a business is its own strategic horror game. So for TEDx Games to run such an honest campaign, to act in transparency is antithetical to a capitalist business model. Judson writes, Against the better financial advice, we've chosen not to create massive all-in bundles to remove bloat and focus on getting you the game with no clutter. There's no bait and switch, the campaign's not barbed with psychological tricks, rather, this publisher grants transparency. See, murky waters favor the hunter as they blind the hunted. When a fisherman sinks their line into the ocean, their greatest tool is not their reel or their rod or their bait, their greatest tool is deceit. Miniatures, deluxe fied components, unlockable content, with every stretch goal, publishers extend their reach digging deeper into our wallets. At the same time we hunt for games, they are hunting for whales. Any competent predator studies the behavior of its prey. There's a psychology to it, a manipulation to it. It's as if TEDx Games has braided a lantern into their fishing line. And so, perhaps counterintuitively, peering into the greater depths of TEDx Games is illuminating. The deeper we descend, the more visibility TEDx grants us. In the world of economics, there exists a capitalist lie. A rising tide lifts all boats. The logic, in my opinion, is so porous and unsound that you don't have to do much to poke holes in it. It posits that if the economy improves, every participant will be better for it. But let's anchor the idea into the harsh realities of the 21st century. We are living in a post-capitalist society in which we have enabled corporations to do irreversible damage to the environment. Though we like to think we have autonomy, it's the megacorporation CEO who's at the wheel. Left unchecked, capitalism incentivizes companies to mortgage long-term costs for short-term gain. The idea that a rising tide lifts all boats holds no water. It's more accurate to say that, thanks to global warming, a rising tide sinks all boats. Despite the fact that we are all on a collision course for a melting iceberg, it would seem that those piloting the Titanic are content to steer us into ruin. And so the band keeps playing, and capitalism sings the same tune. By most accounts, board gaming can be viewed as a small fish in a larger economic pond. But we do have an environmental and economic impact. How much waste does my board game consumption produce? What environmental benchmark should we hold the publishers to? I just think that because gaming is often viewed as an escapist hobby, meaning we turn to alternate worlds with safer, more solvable, and more satisfying problems than the ones presented to us in the real world, we are inclined to let ourselves and publishers off the hook. Why not view both worlds, the real world and the invented world, in tandem? Previously I mentioned the game's bespoke wooden bowie dice. As example, these dice contribute to the overall theme of the game with a splash of tactility. These dice contribute to the world building of the game while not negatively impacting the real world. The game's publisher writes, The seas have enough plastic in them already. We won't be responsible for adding more. By avoiding and replacing components with biodegradable and eco-friendly alternatives, our aim is to completely remove plastic from deep regrets. While personal responsibility for protecting the environment is overshadowed by a handful of massive corporations causing the most harm. We, as mass manufacturers of physical goods, have an opportunity to meaningfully change our impact on the environment for the better, and to pave the way for others to do the same. To synthesize my review, I'll take one more look at the game's cards, which are, for all intents and purposes, the heart of the game. We've already discussed how they have gorgeous artwork on one side, and shadows that allow players to estimate the approximate size of the fish they are catching on the other. In other words, the cards are fronted with theme and backed with functionality. When you closely look at linen cards, of which these cards are, you can see a cross-stitched pattern. Much the same, this game is the very binding of theme, gameplay, function, and sustainability. 
As gamers, we think in terms of resource management and worker placement. We plan for the long term. Why should we expect any less of board game publishers? Fancy wooden dice, metal coins, linen cards, cloth bag and all. Publishers need to begin to think more sustainably.